If you live in Southeast Asia and you see a creature skittering on tree branches, you might think it's a squirrel. Well, you might be correct, but that's not always the case. You might be looking at a tree shrew. So, let me broad up the question. What exactly is tree shrew? While tree shrews have shrew on their name, they are not closely related to shrews. While they resemble squirrels in many ways, they are not squirrels. Squirrels are rodents, while tree shrews are their own order, scandentia, from the Latin word scandere, which means to climb. So their name basically means those who climb. This order is further divided into two families, Tilocerchidae, this one is quite rare, and the common one, Tupaiidae. Now pause. If you are Indonesian or Malaysian, you might be thinking, isn't that the word for squirrel? Well, yes, it is. Kinda, but not really. Depends on who you ask. Indonesian zoologists usually call tree shrews tupai. Meanwhile, squirrels are called bajing. However, tupai is indeed originally used for squirrels. So it's no big deal if you want to use it interchangeably. Just make sure the person you're talking to are not confused. Anyway, Tilocerchidae only have one extant species, Tilocercus lowi. Meanwhile, there are more than 20 species in Tupaiidae family. Most belong in the Tupaia genus, but there are two species in the Dendrogale genus and one species in the Anathana genus. Tree shrews can mostly be found in Sundaland. That is, this area right here. This area is a massive continuous land during Pleistocene after all. However, some tree shrews can also be found towards South Asia. Like I said before, their morphology is somewhat similar to squirrels. They are relatively small, only around 20 to 40 centimeters long on average. They have grays to brownish fur, four legs with five digits on each leg, they have relatively long tail. They also have prominent auricles. The easiest way to identify them is by looking at their head proportion. They have a relatively long snout compared to squirrels. Most of them also don't have long whiskers. However, if you live in Sundaland, there is an animal called shrew-faced squirrel, which might resemble tree shrews. They still have shorter snout compared to tree shrews though. Their tail is also bushier. The striking difference between tree shrews and squirrels is, of course, the teeth. Tree shrews are not rodent, so they don't have the rodent incisors. Squirrels' teeth are more specialized, with bunodon molars, just like our molars. Meanwhile, tree shrews' teeth are less specialized with dilamdodon molars. Dilamdodon means double lambda, by the way. That's because their molars are shaped like two lambdas. Well, you could say it's like W instead. They only have three cusps compared to our four cusp molars. The difference between Tupaidae and Tilocerchidae can be seen on their tail. Tilocerchidae have a bushy tail which resembles a bird feather. That's why they are called the pen-tailed tree shrew. Tilocercus also have long whiskers, while other tree shrews don't. Terrestrial tree shrews are relatively bigger than the arboreal counterparts, albeit not much bigger. They can reach 50 centimeters, but they only weigh up to 300 grams, which is still lightweight. Next, let's talk about their lifestyle and behavior. But before that... Like I hinted before, while most of them are arboreal, some of them are terrestrial. They still live in the forest though, mostly at least. Dendrogala are more arboreal compared to Tupaya and Anathana. Tree shrews usually eat invertebrates such as insects and worms, but can also eat fruits and seeds. They are mostly diurnal, meaning they are active during the day. However, Tilocercus can be active at night. They have good vision, and they have big brains. Relatively, that is. Some claims they have the biggest brain to brain case ratio among all animals. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but even if it's true, 
they are not necessarily smart. Not the smartest, at least. Because brain is not just about the size. So whenever you are complimenting others, don't say they have a big brain. Say they have a um, smart brain instead. Standing back. Anyway, they usually build their nests on tree holes, crevices, or underground. Their nests are usually composed of plant materials. They are observed to sleep curled up with their tail covering their head. They are often seen wandering alone. However, most of them form a monogamous pair that share a territory. Usually, individuals of the same sexes do not share a territory, but group of three to five individuals can be seen interacting and playing for a while. They don't have a breeding season, so they can breed throughout the year. Gestation period lasted around 40 to 50 days. They usually gave birth to one to three offsprings. Their offsprings are all tracial, meaning they are basically helpless and dependent on their parents. However, they are left inside their own natal nest. Their mother doesn't live there. Mother will return to the natal nest every two days to let offspring suckle on it for several minutes. After that, the mother will leave the natal nest and return after two days. This goes on for about four weeks. Offsprings will be weaned within a month. Before that, offsprings are mostly inactive. They don't really make any sounds either. After a month, they will leave the natal nest and follow their mother to its main nest. They will sleep in the main nest together until the offsprings are sexually mature at around 2 to 4 months old. Southeast Asian might be familiar with Nepenthes, right? These picture plants. These are carnivorous plants. They usually attract insects and digest them. However, some of them don't attract insects. Some of them form a mutualistic symbiosis with tree shrews instead. So, I know Indonesians often associate Nepenthes with toilet, right? Because these somewhat resemble toilet. But the thing is, some Nepenthes do evolve to become toilets. To be precise, toilets for tree shrews. They produce nectars not to attract insects, but to attract tree shrews. Tree shrews feed on these nectars and defecate into the pitcher while doing so. Tree shrews' feces contains nitrogen, which is the nutrient that the panthes are looking for by eating insects. So yeah, win-win. On the earlier section, I did say tree shrews are not closely related to squirrels nor shrews, right? So what are their close relatives? Well, there is no conclusive answer to this, yet. We know that they belong in Euarchantogliris, which includes rodents, lagomorphs, colugos, and primates. However, we are not sure of where exactly in the tree they belong to. Some analysis produced tree that showed they are the sister taxon to the gliris, which means they are relatively close to rodents and lagomorphs. Some trees showed they are closely related to primates. Meanwhile, some showed they are the basal group of Euarchantogliris. So yeah, it's not conclusive. We don't really have many tree shrews fossils. However, most of the old fossils were found in China, dating back to early Oligocene, or possibly even Middle Eocene. Because most of the oldest fossils are found in China, there is a high possibility that they originally evolved around China and then dispersed and finally radiated in Sunda land around Pleistocene or even earlier. Fossil evidence suggests that Tilocarchidae might be the basal group of the tree shrews. At the very least, they are morphologically conservative and retain many ancestral traits which are also found in the fossils, which dates back to early Oligocene. That's 34 million years ago, by the way, which is quite exceptional. Tree shrews are relatively small, and they have a relatively brittle skeleton, which is why it's harder for them to be fossilized. More fossil discovery could lead us to a more robust evolutionary tree. Who knows when or if that will happen. For now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, if you are watching this video quite early, Happy New Year! Hope 2025 will be a great year for you. 
even if not, at least let it be a fun year. Anyway, enjoy your day.